Hello and welcome to my workshop. In this video, we are continuing to do some CNC work with the Snapmaker. This is the third episode in the series of creating slopes and curves for your CNC. And so far, we've learned about the relationship between the tool path and the cutting bit, how to create topography manually, and how to create topography automatically. Now we are going to delve into another function in Inkscape and probably in any other graphic software, and that is gradients. Gradients, as the name suggests, gradually move you from one color to another. And the easiest way to understand them is to go through an example. Here we are in Inkscape and let me explain the setup. We all have already seen that shape before. We have seen it in the previous two episodes and that's the shape of our salad server as we are seeing it from the top. I have already created the outermost path so that when the flat end mill cuts along the path, it doesn't cut beyond the border. Now, gradients are perfect if you are using a V carving bit because then you can butt the gradient right up to the border of your shape. But now we are going to be using the flat end mill and that's why we need to have that space between the border and the outermost path. The vertical line right here represents the lowest point of our desired profile curve. And the horizontal line here represents the center line of our shape. So our bottom point centered is going to be around here. I'm going to be talking about the other guides a little later on. So let's forget them for now. When I created the outermost path, I made sure that it doesn't have a stroke color. And the stroke color is basically the, uh, the line right here that you see. Uh, it has a fill, but it doesn't have a stroke. To create a gradient, I simply go to the gradient tool. I have the option of selecting linear or radial gradient. And because our shape is circular in nature, I'm going to pick radial and then I make sure that create gradient in the fill is selected. And then I simply click on my origin and drag outwards. And this is a gradient. Now I know it doesn't look much, but we have to make some changes. Uh, the gradients in Inkscape can be applied on color and or opacity. So we have to make sure that we have the right color and the right opacity at the same time. To change the color at the origin, select the origin node, which is usually square in nature. And I am going to change it to complete black. And I'm going to make sure that the alpha channel or the opacity is at 100%. And to change the outermost color, I simply click on the node. I can choose either this or this one right here. It does basically the same thing. And this is the desired color that I need, but we see that the opacity is zero, so I'm going to change it to 100. And there we are. We have a gradient from black to white-ish. Uh, with these handles, you can stretch the gradient in any direction you like. Um, because this is a radial gradient, it does it in two dimensions. So basically, uh, you can create either a circle or an ellipse with it. So as we can see right now, this is what the gradient would look like. And here comes the other vertical guide. So those are random guides that I just put in. And then I used my color select tool to find out what the color is at those guides. And we can see right here down at the bottom, well, we do see the hex of the color at each space. And then I calculated what the depth of cut would be for each particular uh, guide. And this is what we have. So obviously we see that this particular smaller gradient is only going to cut a smaller chunk of what we need. I mean, obviously it will go to the depth we want it to go. Uh, but then it is just going to rise up and there is going to be plenty of wood left to be cut out either at the second pass with a second gradient or we have to find another way to do it. For the sake of our example, I'm going to keep this and uh, we'll see how it goes once we start doing the CNC with a flat end mill. I am going to move ahead and show you another version of this 
but this time uh, everything is to the left side of our uh, lowest point guide. So we're going to create a gradient here as well. But this time it is going to the left edge, which is so the distance is a lot bigger. And let's do the same thing as we did before. We change that to complete black and we change the outermost node to our desired color and opacity. And so we can see now that it's completely different shape to the gradient. And the one thing about gradients is that they're always going to be symmetrical. Similar to what we have seen with the automated way of creating the tool path or the interpolate method, it is always symmetrical. Uh, I'm going to use this example to show you how you can manipulate a gradient. At those particular guides, I am going to hover over my a gradient line and we see that there is a little plus sign that gets created right here at the intersect point. Once I double click it creates a node. So I'm going to create nodes at all those locations. And then as you guessed it I can change the color of the node. So in this one right here I'm going to use 90% grayscale. At this particular node, I'm going to use 80. At this, I'm going to use 70. At this, I'm going to use 40. And at this, I'm going to use 5. When I click and hold on a particular node, I can move it in any direction. Well, in this case, left or right but I can click on that one and move it up and down. It's going to do the same thing and that is extend the, uh, the width of the gradient. So we have found a way to manipulate the gradient, but because of the symmetric nature, it reflects it at the back as well. So even though we are creating a nice and gradual curve at the front, our back is going to be <laughs> literally unknown. And you might be wondering, is there a way to augment the gradient so uh, at least it's more controllable here at the back? <laughs> well, I have experimented with one way. It's not pretty, but I'm still going to show it to you. <laughs> let's go back to Inkscape and let's go right here. I am going to click on the node tool so that I can see where the nodes are for my outermost path. And what I'm going to do next is place guides where the nodes are. I click on the Bezier Curve tool and I simply go through all the places where I created the, the guides, the intersect point of all the guides. So we have one right here. We have one right here, then here, here, and then back to my top line. So in essence, and I'm going to keep the, the black uh, line here, obviously didn't do a good job. Um, so let me add a node and move it up here. Uh, so basically what I did is I created a shape that is just for the front part of the outermost path. And now I'm going to do the same and create a shape for the path that is represented at the back right here. And that's very similar to what we did earlier. Just click on the intersect points of the nodes and back to the first one. So basically I created two shapes and now I am going to smooth out the, um, the angles. So clicking on the node tool and then clicking on each particular node and selecting this 
uh, auto smoothness of the curve. And we may need to do some adjustment on the back shape to come up with the curve that we need. So there we are, just a tiny adjustment and the same thing at the bottom. I will get rid of my initial shape so that it doesn't get confusing anymore. I am going to remove the stroke color but do a fill of 240 and the same thing for the back shape. So it's like nothing happened. But we, we are seeing right here that we have created two separate paths. And now what I'm going to do is create a gradient for each of the paths. And we begin at the lowest point and move uh, to the other edge of our path. And of course we need to change the colors. So we have one gradient here. Now let's create the similar gradient for the other shape. Again, beginning at our lowest point to the edge and again, changing the colors and opacity. What we have created so far are two paths that are butted against each other. Each path has a gradient of its own and each gradient begins at the exact same point. But there is one minor detail that we need to take a look at, and it's so minor we have to magnify it roughly 10,000%. Let me show it here. So, the left side of the blue line represents the front path, and the right side of the blue line represents the back path. And we can see lighter color at the front up until here, and then a slightly darker color. Versus at the back, we have lighter color all the way up there, and then we have the darker color. Uh, this is all caused by the dimension of the gradient. So we can see that the front gradient has a dimension of the center of the line to the actual guideline for the outermost path, whereas the back gradient has the dimension of the origin to an actual point on the path. So the back gradient is slightly smaller than the front, and there's two ways to adjust it. One is enlarge the back gradient, or the way I'm going to do it right now, is uh, shrink the front gradient a little bit. So we can see that little bit of a difference. But at this point right now, we have that continuity between the front and the back. And so far, this gives us the best overall shape, except for the pointier front. Uh, we can see right here the color of the gradient. So there is going to be this area right here and the corresponding area at the bottom that are not going to be cut according to our desired shape. And at this point you can begin modifying your gradient like we have seen before by adding nodes at different locations and assigning different grayscale at each location. But make sure whatever you're doing at the front you mirror it for the back as well and that way you have that continuity for which we just adjusted. Now let's take the three shapes and run them through the CNC and see what happens. Let's compare the CNC cutout to our graphic. Uh, once again, we see a one-to-one -one representation. Even the line that we see here, that is basically the join line between our two paths, that is also represented in the cutout. Now, I'm not sure if it's properly seen on the camera, but when I tilt my head, I see a bump. And when I drag the two, I feel just a slight bump as well. We also see the elliptical nature of the gradient, even though our shape has a blunt face to it. And we see the elliptical nature of the gradient here and here, and the potential areas where the wood is not cut. And they are definitely represented here, here, 
and the other two locations. And let's take some measurements. Unlike before, I'll be taking the height measurement as opposed to the length because the way I place the origin and the graphic, it cut out into the cutout of the interpolate method behind the plate. So the length measurement is not going to be accurate. So we're going to be looking at the height. We're going to be going for the middle graphic and our outermost layer has a height of 33.012 millimeters and once we add the tool diameter of 3.175 so we're looking at 36.1 millimeters and let us check that dimension right now from here to here we are looking at 35.7 which is an excellent so not too much distortion Let's compare the methods side by side. The top right three, they represent the manual method. Top left three represent the interpolate method and the bottom left three are the gradient method. Definitely we can see smoother slopes and curves on the gradient method. And that is kind of equivalent to making 30 paths on the manual and the interpolate methods. But we also see the drawback of the gradient method, and that is the shape of the gradient. With a long gradient like we had right here, because it's elliptical, we are getting a little bit of a pointier nose right here. And this cutout right here represents the shape that we wanted. So we can see that there is an area here and here that is left uncut. And with the manual and the interpolate methods, we always get to the shape that we wanted. So there is advantages to every method and also drawbacks to every method. Up until now we have discussed three different methods of doing slopes and curves. And we've seen that each method has certain drawbacks. The good news is you're not limited to picking only one of those methods. In the next episode we are going to be combining a few of them to see if we can come up with something better. And in the final episode we are going to be looking at the best curve ever. Stay tuned. If you like this video, make sure to like, share and subscribe and also hit the notification bell to get notified of my future video releases. Also, follow me on all social media channels and consider supporting me on Patreon. All the links are down in the description.